continuing on with our series in Philippians. So I invite you to turn there to Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. You will notice a little bit of overlap between my sermon and Pastor Ben's sermon this morning when it comes to our love as the church, but we figured that that would be okay for us to hear two sermons on love in one Lord's day. So Philippians 1, verses 7 through 11, and as I said last week, I'm continuing to read in ESV. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. Father, you tell us that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It discerns the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Nothing is hidden from your sight. So do a work in our hearts this evening, Lord, by your word and by your spirit. Create in us clean hearts. Renew a right spirit within us. Do this all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Love is the great enigma of our time. And we need not look far to see that this is true. There is perhaps nothing our culture is more confused about than love. Our culture tells us that all you need is love. Love is God. The most important part of your life is to find a romantic partner. But at the same time, somehow, the meaning of life is to really learn to love yourself and to accept yourself above all else. Culture tells us that love is love, and that no one should place any sort of requirements on marriage or relationships. Nothing matters. Love is love. And yet, at the same time, our identity, the deepest part of our identity, is who we love and how we love such that you can and should change your biology to match your feelings of love and desire. We live in a world that is confused about love. And if we're not careful, we as the church can so quickly become enveloped in this confusion and buy into the world's categories as we seek to love one another. Saying things like, at this church we're all about love, no judgment here, just love, acceptance, and tolerance. You know, at the surface, that may sound pretty good, but is that love? Is that love? Brothers and sisters, we need an answer to that question. The question, what does love in the church look like? What characterizes love in the body of Christ? Our answer to that question is, so critical because it's so easy for the love of the world to become the love of the church. For the Christian love of the church to slowly erode and become the counterfeit love of the world. And when that happens, the church of Christ ceases to become the church of Christ and becomes the church of the world. Counterfeit. We need to be able to distinguish between true and counterfeit love. And as any FBI agent will tell you, the, the way to spot a counterfeit bill, the best way to spot a counterfeit bill is to study and learn and observe and know the real thing. And so that's what we'll do this evening. Paul, the author of Philippians, knew what the stakes were for this Philippian church. He knew that they needed to get love right. So as he wrote this letter to this church, he knew that he had to model for them the nature of true Christian love. This is what we find in verses 7 through 11 of chapter 1. Verses 7 through 11 answer the question, what characterizes love in the body of Christ? 
Last week, one of the things that we looked at was how thankfulness for the body of Christ, for partners in the gospel, is a source of invincible joy. This week, we, we look at how we as the church, as partners in the gospel, are to love one another and what characterizes that love. And the categories that we use are not the categories of the world, but the categories that the Word of God gives to us that we find here in verses 7 through 11 of Philippians 1. In particular, we find two characteristics of love in the body of Christ, two non-negotiable categories that we are to have in our minds as we seek to love one another. First, we see that love supports. Second, we'll see that love grows. So first, love supports. If you look back at me at verse 7 and 8 for a moment, they say, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and, the, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how my yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul begins this section by saying, it is right for me to feel this way about you all. And what does he mean? Feel what way? Well, as we just saw last week, Paul modeled a life formed by invincible joy, a life filled with humility, thankfulness, a life lived in confidence. Paul's saying here that it is right for him to feel all of these things for this church because he holds them in his heart. In other words, because he loves them. He's saying, it is right for me to feel this way about you because I love you. Everything that Paul does towards, says to, and prays for this congregation is done out of love. And as he says here, this is the right way for him to feel about them. Paul here is modeling the correct way of thinking, of feeling about our fellow Christians. The correct motivation for everything that we do, love. Everything is done in love. But as we just said, we need a definition of that love. And we find the first characteristic, the first definition at the end of verse 7. Paul says, I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He calls the Philippians partakers of grace. And the word partakers used here has the same root as the word that Paul used in verse 5 last week for partnership. It's the Greek word koinonia. To have something in common, to participate in something, to have a partnership in something. We hear, we see here that Paul and the Philippian church are partakers. They're partners in grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Grace is receiving a gift. The root of the Greek word for grace is where we get our word charity. It's receiving something freely as a gift. And it's easy to see why Paul calls this church his partners, his fellow partakers in grace. Paul has just received a tremendous gift of support from the Philippian church. He's received charity, grace from the Philippians. But notice that Paul does not call the Philippians givers of grace. He calls them partakers, partners in grace. But why is that? Because in the mind of Paul, the Philippians did not give away anything freely that they, did, that they did not first receive freely. They gave away freely what they received freely. The Philippians were given grace, the gift of God's provision freely, and they gave grace and provision freely. Paul could do nothing for them as he sat in that prison. He was in chains. And yet they still supported him Freely, They were participants in a system of grace. And it's in this that we find the true nature of Christian love. Love that supports. Love that supports is based on the truth that as the body of Christ, we are partners, we are participants in grace. 
God has blessed us all richly by his grace, with time, with money, with gifts and abilities, with prayer, with everything that we have. And so we freely give and receive support to one another in love. This is how we are to love one another. We freely give a meal to a family in our congregation who just had a baby. We freely give our time to the nursery and Sunday school. We freely spend an afternoon or an evening with the shut-in or the lonely in our body. We freely buy some donuts and support our youth. We freely pray for the grieving and the suffering in our body. We are partners, supporters based on grace. And it's this type of partnership, a partnership of grace, that is totally different than worldly partnership. This was true both in Paul's day and now in our day. This is the way a worldly partnership works. Each partner brings something of value to the relationship. They bring their gifts, their skills, their abilities to the relationship, and both sides mutually benefit. If one side doesn't keep up their end of the bargain, the other side has the right to make demands on them. It's a transactional relationship based on value. So that again, a worldly partnership is a transactional relationship based on value. That's not the way we are to be as the body of Christ. For an illustration of this type of relationship of a worldly partnership, we need to look no further than the popular TV show Shark Tank. Now, I don't usually watch this TV show, but if it happens to be on in a waiting room or an airport or something, it usually captures my attention for at least a few minutes, and it doesn't take long to catch the premise. Participants on Shark Tank are essentially selling themselves and their businesses to a panel of super rich investors called the Sharks. They come on there to convince the Sharks that they and their businesses are worth partnering, that they're worth supporting. And it's a high bar. Those who come onto the show pitching a cafe for cats or an alarm clock that cooks bacon for you when you wake up are usually not successful. It's a high bar. You have to demonstrate your value. This is the essence of worldly partnership. You demonstrate your worth and your value, and then you earn support. This is not how it is to be in the church. We do not evaluate each other based on our perceived value and decide whether or not to support one another. We give away freely what we have received freely. This is Christian love. And where do we get this kind of love from? If we look back at verse 8, it says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. The affection, the love, with which Paul loves the Philippian church is the affection, the love of Christ. This affection, this word affection that Paul uses here, is a word for the kind of love that comes from the bottom of your heart. It means literally a feeling from your guts. It's a deep feeling. Love. This is the love and the affection that we have from Christ, a deep and abiding love. And it is the resource that we, put, that we draw on to love one another. There is nothing that we have to drum up as we seek to love one another. We have all the resources in Christ. As Jesus said in John 13, 34, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The love comes in Christ. Now you might say, Pastor Daniel, sometimes I don't feel like loving. Sometimes I don't feel like supporting my fellow believer. Times like these, you would do well to follow the advice of C.S. Lewis in his book, Your Christianity, where he says, Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. And this is the work of Christ's affection in you by his spirit. So first, love supports. 
second of rows. If you look back at me at verse 9 for a moment, it says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So we see here, one of Paul's prayers for the Philippian congregation is that their love would abound more and more. This language of abounding more and more describes a process of dynamic growth and maturation. That's what Paul means here. Love grows. As love abounds and grows more and more in the heart of the believer, they, they grow up into maturity in Christ. This is the connection. It goes both ways. Love leads to maturity, and maturity leads to love. And what does this maturity look like? If you look back at the end of verse 9 with me, it says, Knowledge and all discernment. Knowledge and all discernment. As we, are, as we mature in love, we grow in knowledge. This is a distinctive of Christian love. For the Christian, knowledge and love are inextricably linked. Love without knowledge is vain and superficial. You need to know someone to love them and to love them well. Here's an example. Mother's Day is coming up. A week from today. And I'm hoping that by and large you all love your mother. And if you're married and you have children, you love the mother of your children. And hopefully you know her as well. And since you know her and you love her, the gift that you're going to give for her this week is going to reflect that knowledge and that love. That's my sincere hope. You will not get her a new vacuum cleaner. You will not get her a new mop. You will not get her a book on how to be a good mom. You know better than that. You know better than that. Because you know her, and you love her, you love her well. Christian love is rooted in knowledge. And that is true of our love for each other, and it's true of our love for God. When we fail to love God as we should, it is almost always the result of our lack of knowledge of Him as He is. This is what we find in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verses 1 and 6. <laughs> It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you for being a priest to me. It's a strong rebuke. If we are to grow in our love for God, we must grow in our knowledge of Him and of His Word. If we say we love God, but we do not know Him, our love is a vain and superficial love. And not only is our love to abound more and more in knowledge, it's to abound more and more in discernment. Discernment is not the same thing as knowledge. Discernment is how you apply what you know. Discernment, like wisdom, is knowledge that's applied to daily life. It's the ability to make wise choices based on what you know. You need wisdom, you need discernment to be able to love well. I'll illustrate it for you. Imagine that you have a neighbor that you really, really want to love. And you notice that he has a hard time getting outside to mow his lawn. And so you decide that you are going to love your neighbor by mowing his lawn. So far, so good. But you decide that you're going to mow his lawn at midnight. But your neighbor comes outside, terrified, at 12.05 a.m. To you mowing his lawn with a headlamp on, do you think that he's going to feel particularly loved? I don't think so. That's not a wise way to love someone. That is not based on discernment. True love is rooted in knowledge and discernment. This is Christian love. Love that abounds more and more to our spiritual maturity and our ability to make wise choices on how to love somebody well. This is what we read in verses 10 and 11. That we grow in love and knowledge of the servant so that you may approve what is excellent, so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Approving what is excellent means more specifically choosing 
what is best. Choosing what is best. Growing up in our ability to choose how to love one another well and how to live in response to the gospel is the description of maturity. As we continue to read, it says that we grow in maturity through love so that we may be able to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. This is the goal of all Christian love, our continued growth and sanctification in Christ, that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ. And that last part is so critical to understanding this passage. Through Jesus Christ. If we miss it, we miss the meaning of this passage, we miss the true nature of Christian love. True Christian love is a fruit of righteousness, of our justification that comes through Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Here's why this is so critical. As Christians, we believe that the ability to love, the ability to love well and rightly does not come from within us. Love is not natural to our fallen state. True love, Christian love, love within the body of Christ, is the fruit of our righteousness and justification through Christ. We are not born with the ability to love like this. We are born again into the ability to love like this. So we heard just a few weeks ago in 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. This love is from God. When we love like this, as it says here, it is all done for the glory of God. This love is from Him and it's to Him that He would be glorified and made much of by our love for each other and for Him. This is Christian love. There is no book that you can read to get it. There's no program that you can follow to learn it. You receive it as a gift of your new life in Christ. We love because He first loved us. We are loved to love. As we grow in our knowledge and love of Christ, we grow in our knowledge and love of each other as well. Love grows. And as we grow in love and grace, we support one another, freely giving away all we have freely received by God's grace. Love supports and love grows. So points of application as we come to close. What is your relationship like, the body of Christ, with this covenant community? Is it characterized by love? But Pastor Ben commented on this a little bit this morning, but I'm going to drill in a little bit more closely on perhaps those who are already serving in the church. I'm not asking, do you do things for this church or are you involved here? I'm asking, do you love this church and the people in it? Is your service motivated by that love and by your love for Christ? Is that the motivation? You know, one of the most spiritually dangerous things that we can do is to do all the right things for all the wrong reasons. To do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, and Christ our Savior warned us about this. When we do this, we slowly become whitewashed tombs. Everything looks good on the outside, we're serving and we're involved, but on the inside, filled with dead things. It's a relationship with Christ characterized by love and love for his church. What does your love look like for the body of Christ? That's a good diagnostic. Does it look like a transactional partnership based on value, or is it a partnership of grace where you freely give away what you've freely received? What do your prayers look like for the body of Christ? Do you pray for this church? Do you love, in love, long for and pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ to grow and mature in love and in faith in Jesus Christ? Are you growing in love? spiritual maturity as a result of your relationship with Christ. Do you see God working in your life like that? Would it be so? If not, would we be willing to humble ourselves, to pray, and to ask God to give us all of these things by His grace, and He is faithful. 
will surely do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the amazing love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. You've demonstrated your love in the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Help us, Lord, to love one another as you have loved us. Help us to support one another freely, giving away all you have given to us freely by your grace. Cause our love to abound more and more, and more Father, in knowledge and discernment so that we may grow up more and more into spiritual maturity. Do this all on us, Father, for the sake of Christ, for your glory. Amen.